This meeting is being recorded. So hi, Matt from Festival of Martial Arts today, and I'm here speaking with Tommy Joe Moore. Hi, Tommy, how are you? I'm very well, thank you, mate. How are you? I'm good, my friend. I'm good. Thanks for coming along. So this is the, how I start all of these sort of conversations, just a brief overview of sort of who you are and your background, just for people that may not have uh, sort of know what it is that you do. All righty, cool. Uh, well, like I said, I'm Tommy Joe Moore. Uh, many people will probably know me from, from a couple of things I do recently. So uh, I tend to go around the country teaching World War II era combative, so getting people interested in that kind of stuff. Uh, the Victorian early mixed martial art of Bartitsu and boxing for self-defense. So those are the three things that people might know me for for today. But, you know, growing up, big things in my martial history and, and universal red threads. Boxing, got taken to a boxing gym at age five and haven't left since. And judo, always loved judo. But as uh, soon as my knees, shoulders and hips gave up their bending, as they say, <laughs> at 25, that's been reduced a fair bit. But I'm still very, very active on the boxing. And then from that, I did lots of different things as I went. So, for example, um, a lot of people might be familiar with Eddie Quinn. Eddie Quinn was one of my first Thai boxing instructors. Lovely, lovely man. Uh, Nigel Trotman, one of my Jeet Kune Do instructors. Um, Alain Jean-Baptiste, one of my Sabat instructors. So for me, I've had solid, consistent arts in judo and boxing. And then everything else I've kind of picked up, explored, play with for, you know, four, five, six, seven years. And, and that's how I like to do it. I like to do concerted cross training, mapping out plans, things I'm either interested in, things I feel like I'm in skills deficit for, or things that are just fun. You know, it, there's no crime against just doing it because it's fun. So for me, that's been a big part of my life. And I, I like to span, and I, I think you do this as well. You know, I like to span combatives, martial arts and, and martial sports. And again, there's nothing wrong with combining all three because it's great to combine all three. So, you know, I've found myself on all sides of those fences as I've kind of gone forward. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, because quite often you hear, um, you hear people talk about the different areas of martial arts as if they were as if they were in competition with one another when actually that for my experience that's not the case they actually they actually help to shore one another up yeah exactly and they're, they're all ingredients of the same cake and if the more ingredients you got the better that cake's going to be you know and different things match different phases of your life as well if you're coming to you know martial arts as a as a younger person then potentially the martial sports route might be a really great way to spend the first 15 20 years of your journey that's brilliant you know if you come and get it to a bit later, you might need a less of that, but doesn't mean you're excluded entirely. And there might be other aspects of the tradition or the self-defense that you really want to ramp up. So it's all just dials of your life and, and matching what you want out of it. Yeah, I agreed. Again, stages in life, I think, is quite important to what what you prioritize in your training at that time yeah. as you go along. So, I, yeah, I, I totally get that. So with regards to your own training then the boxing, I understand the judo, I understand, because back at a certain time of life, boxing and judo were kind of the things that were available. And that's kind of what most of us fell into as an initial start point. Um, but then you talked about some other things. Savat as an example, there doesn't seem to be a great deal of Savat here in the UK. So how did you find yourself um, following that pathway? So I think if, if you love martial arts, you're an educated customer. So these things won't come looking for you. If you want something that's outside of the, the normal array of your local Taekwondo club or your local Aikido club or whatever, then you have to hunt it down because the more niche the art, I, the less likely they are to be marketing very well, the less likely they are to be very geographically frequent. So you have to hunt it down. And, and you know, I have a big love for Western martial arts system. So when I started to find out more about Savat, I had to work really hard to find where are people that teach this, message them, hunt them down and get going. And I managed to find Alain, which is, is brilliant. Is uh, you know, he's about as aggressively French when it comes to fight as you could possibly. It's great. He's, you know, they, they don't mess around. They do not mess around in Savat. It's a great system. Uh, for those that don't know, it's essentially a kickboxing system with shoes on where the tip and the boot of the shoe are made of very hard rubber. And when that goes in you, it's very, it's about accurate placement of shots. And there are full contact versions and there are kind of semi continuous versions and they flow together very, very nicely. But essentially it's, it's boxing and kickboxing with certain mechanics that are very unique to Savat. Um, but yeah, I loved it. Absolutely love 
that system. Alain is a fantastic instructor in the Midlands. Um, and again, I like things where you can add a couple of tools to your tool belt as well. You know, you don't have mm. to, you don't have to, when you engage in a system, you don't have to take everything. You know, I like that kick. I like that movement. I like that training drill, that methodology. You know, that's what it was really like. And so trained with Alain for years. Um, lovely, lovely guy. Um, yeah. Really enjoyed it. Yeah. And because it's a different way of moving and a different way of kicking, you know, there's only so many ways to kick, but it's got nuances to it. You can often catch people out that are expecting, say, your traditional Thai teep or your traditional Thai round kick. You know, you can, mm. because people haven't experienced some of these things before, you can get away with some really cheeky shots. Not all the time, but it, it's great when you do. Yeah, absolutely. And have they managed to get you into one of their outfits yet? Because that's one of the things that Savat is famous for, isn't it? The, oh, um, the, the outfits they wear. The integral. Yeah, I mean, amount of my stature shouldn't really be put in the <laughs> But yeah, I have fought in uh, essentially the sausage casing that is the uh, Savat Integral. But you know, it's, you can't be too self-conscious with this. All martial arts uniforms are daft, aren't they? Let's be honest. Thai boxing shorts, you know, we only think it's cool because Thai boxing is cool. But let's be honest, a lot of them are bright pink with frills and tassels. Kickboxing, you all remember the kickboxing trousers of the 90s, ridiculous. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. These are ridiculous. So you know, if you get too self-conscious about what you're wearing, that you're focusing on the wrong stuff. It's a, it's a bit of a laugh. It's their tradition. They've trended them up a bit more now, so they're actually a top and like tight trousers. But they're still a little bit weird. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fair enough. So that takes us forward then, because again, one of the things that you're sort of known for these days is yeah. the um, I'll use the term historical arts. Yes. But I but I, but I don't use that in a derogatory manner. Um, so the the Bartistu and the the World War II combatives kind of stuff, things like that. So how did you again fall into those kind of things so I'm, I'm really really a big advocate of what's known as HEMA historical European mm. martial arts and essentially it's a bit of a, a reconstructionist movement in that people will look back at sourcing like right German longsword we've got these manuals these guides this we can start with and then we need to experiment and we can spar and drill and build it out and I'm really big on that scene I'm really big in, in weapons training um, and the unarmed aspects of HEMA so things that you know, have no necessarily living lineage to them. You know, the things that, that were made and then largely ignored, the unarmed as elements of those were being resurrected by people that had never fought, had never really done any hard training, you know, hadn't mm -hmm. really done the things necessary to be able to bring them back properly. Uh, and look at it like, well, I have those skills. I have that experience. I can do this in a way in which I believe it was intended. So for mm -hmm. me, it's about pulling together the sources, the practitioners, as much material and content as you can, and bringing it back as living history. And that's something I take all over the country. And it's still an experiment because mm. one knows. No, no one will give you the answer. This is this is right. This is wrong. But it bloody works. I mean, I took those World War II combative materials. I took them out into Ukraine last year, training soldiers with them. Still valid. Mm. Still works. Still strong. I don't know if people have trained with Eastern Europeans, but unless you can land it on them hard while they resist you, they will not do it. <laughs> it's just part of the culture. They're like, do it to me. And yes. they'll yeah. you to, to stop you. Um, but yeah, it, you know, I really enjoy those systems and platforms. I think they hold great value today of historical interest, but also martial interest. You know, it's very mm. useful stuff. And it's just about what flavor can I bring to that, trying to bring it back to life. Yeah, yeah. No, that's an interesting take on it because um, his, years and years ago, I remember being really frustrated because I was watching judo at the Olympics and <clears throat> the, the camera people that was doing the filming clearly had no clue about what they were looking at. And so even though it was a really, you know, high level competition with really top level players, best in the world, you know, at what they did, yeah. it was really hard to get involved because they were focusing on all the wrong things. They, you know, they couldn't translate that through the screen. Um, and I remember that, and I remember being really frustrated about it. And as you say with HEMA, there's, there's a very real um, uh, group of people that are very, very, um, very clever, very articulate, very educated uh, within sort of academia, but can't necessarily physically translate that. And it's, yeah. it's, it's that mix, isn't it? It's finding that sort of, you know, how does that translate in the physical sense? Um, I was talking to Jason Hulot the other day, as uh, I know you do quite a bit with, with him and him, and um, it was an interesting conversation in and around the fact that, um, you know, most of the principles that we today think are 
accurate and workable and representative of current martial arts you you can find those you know five six eight hundred years ago um pretty much identical <laughs> uh, and so that's so that's an interesting take on that but you've obviously modernized it updated it i don't mean updated the techniques necessarily but the way you present it because again yeah. one of the things you're kind of known for is um an interesting way of running seminars with your whistles and your, your big gearish outfits um and is that is that is that did, have you done that on purpose is that a oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah i mean for those that that might know a bit of my background um my my early career was as a teacher and i used to teach predominantly in youth offender uh, organizations or pupil referral units so um, if you've been convicted of crimes or if you're on that pathway if your behavior is very very bad and you can't be in a mainstream school you, you'd come to you'd come to me and the certain things that you suss out you know it's great most of the weaknesses in martial arts teachers is that they've never really had good experience in teaching they've never really been taught how to teach they've just looked at what their instructors done mm -hmm. for the past five years and emulate that now by happenstance that still still makes good instructors. There are still good instructors that come from that, but there's a lot to be said to knowing what you're on about when it comes mm. to educating people and crafting learning outcomes and can people retain this content, all this stuff, you know, it's, it's all useful gear. Mm. Um, but yeah, my teaching style is very deliberate. I want people to enjoy it. I want people, if you don't enjoy it, you won't retain it. You know, so I go there. I'm predominantly a seminar instructor because I'm still competing, I'm still fighting, and I still travel a lot for work. I selfishly do not run a regular club, and that's by design. I've chosen not to do that because that's unfair mm -hmm. on people. If I'm running in like right, every second Wednesday, I have to go, you know, X amount of sparring, or I need to go, it's, it's not right. So my main job that I position myself is I will come to the club. I will give you a bloody good session. I'll give you some drills, techniques, and things for you to take away and experiment and play with. And, and that's my part of the deal, energy in, energy out. And I think I'm relatively well known for high energy seminars in that when I go and teach at a place, you get 110% of me for, you know, for the for the X amount of hours you got, mm. you've got to get your money's worth and you're going to get your efforts worth. I hate limp, languid instructors. You know, you energy in, energy out always. And that's a big thing for me. So blasting the whistles, blasting the music, crazy drills, props, all this stuff. It's all about making sure people have fun retain the content you know a seminar should feel and be different to your day to day so mm. there's no point just rocking up to what is in essence a long class that's not the point that's dead boring you know mm. these themed and planned and i put a lot of effort into planning my seminars you know i will rock up with a very robust often often too long lesson plan of things i want to cover outcomes i want to achieve and places that people can go if they enjoyed it to find out more about the things i've taught so structure planning and energy are big for me and you know one of my early instructors being eddie quinn he got energy when, when mm. eddie quinn steps on the mat you listen you enjoy you know he always says if you leave my session being a bit safer and feeling a bit happier i've done my job and that's the kind of a mantra I've, I've stolen willingly and i think that well that works if i've made you a little bit safer if you're two percent safer than when you came in and you're five percent happier fucking job's done job's done yeah no perfect sense so that brings us nicely into the festival itself and i appreciate yeah. you uh, agreeing to come along and, and and join in with that because it's you know we, we've got a great bunch of people involved it's going to be a, a superb event so what is it that you're looking to be doing there have you got a plan in mind yeah absolutely so i will be covering my my world war ii syllabus and it will be aimed because predominantly, you know, a large portion of the demographic coming to that festival will be instructors themselves. You know, let's be honest, there are a lot of people that already are running clubs or have been in clubs for some time. So it'll be how can you run a session on this stuff with your own people? And I want to get people thinking in the session. So I'm going to introduce some techniques, some drills, some principles. But in my session, I'm going to encourage people to be creative themselves. Every martial artist should be creative. Martial arts is about creative problem solving under fire. So I'll be showing some things, explaining some things, giving you some drills, which I believe are really cool. And then I want to see how people translate that into their world, into their arts and their systems. That's the only way this stuff is ever going to live and thrive. So you're going to explore some really cool World War II drills, some really cool World War II techniques, and you're going to explore finding ways to bring that into whatever you do, whether you're in sporting systems, self-defense systems, or traditional systems, there'll be a way in which you can bring that bit of history, bit of legacy, bit of, bit of fun activity into your martial life. 
Fantastic. Yeah, no, that sounds really interesting. And I'm sure lots of people will be looking forward to taking part in that. Um, so in the meantime, uh, how can people reach you if they want to speak to you before then? So easiest ways to find me. I am more than happy for people to find me and add me on Facebook. Just search Tommy Joe Moore. Look for a ginger egg and I'll be there. Uh, you can go on YouTube. So I've got a big old YouTube channel. It's like I've got 600 odd videos, some of them like three hour long DVDs that are all for free that people can go on there. So if you just type Tommy Joe Moore into YouTube, you'll find me, you'll find my logo, you'll find all my videos. The early ones are hokey and very poor. The newer ones are also terribly sharp, but there's a lot of stuff to play with, a lot of material to explore. And there's lots of stuff that I've done with other instructors. For example, if people want to look at how to integrate sumo trips, throws and strikes into their material, I've got videos of a big seminar I've done with Joe Saunders covering just that on the YouTube channel. So it's rich and full of things for people to explore. Combatives, fight sports. They can watch some of my boxing matches on there. They can do all sorts of stuff. Um, so go mooch there on YouTube. Those are the two best places. And I'd always encourage people, uh, I think you probably back me on this. If you want to do something with a martial artist, just say hello. Just drop a message. You know, there's, there's no harm. <laughs> you know, people get yeah. worried like, oh, that person might be expensive to do a seminar with, or my club's not big enough, or they might be too busy, or blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. don't worry about it. And it's not just for me. It's for, I think any good martial artist, if you write them a message, you message them on Facebook, you whatever you do, all good people will respond to you and be considerate of your time. So if people want to ask mm -hmm. me stuff, you know, have Q&As, they want seminars, they want to do anything, just say hello. Yes. Yeah. In all fairness, most of us don't need a lot of encouragement to talk about martial arts, do we? <laughs> <laughs> so on that note, um, I will say thanks ever so much for coming on today. And we really look forward to having you at the festival. And I will uh, make sure I stick the link to your YouTube channel in the comments for this. So thanks for coming along, Tommy. No worries. My pleasure. Cheers, buddy. Cheers, mate.